you make a difference to the church, make a difference to the lost, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Lord, we thank you for your word today. I ask for your help. Divine unction, Lord, and impartation for, Lord, your word to go forward for the quickening, the edifying, the building, the drawing of people to a closer walk with you. Let us lay aside all the weights and the sins that the sins that you set us and let us again keep ourselves in the love of God, making a difference, reaching out and pulling anyone and everyone we can out of the fire. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. amen. God bless you. You can be seated. Being in the love of God and being involved in reaching the lost are inseparable. I'll say that again. Being in the love of God. Let me ask you this. If you have a loved one that you love, but you're not actively involved in assisting them, do you love them? Love's a verb. Love's a... So if you say you love God, then you'd be involved in reaching the lost because it's inseparable. There are those that believe the gospel. Do I have any gospel believers here tonight? And there are those that believe people need the gospel to be saved. Are there any of those here tonight? Amen. Three. And then there are those actively involved in taking the gospel to those they believe that need the gospel to be saved to make sure they get it. Are there any of those in the house Amen. today? Luke chapter 14, verse 23. And the Lord said unto the servants, you got a lot of saints, Got a lot of believers, but very few that are Paul and Master and become a servant. And he can tell you, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. Jesus is giving a parable to his people about the last day, the last hour that the disciples needed to know exactly what they should be doing in and for the kingdom of God. See, it's easy just to show up to the church house. And there's a lot that happens in here that's important. What you're going to find in our story, if you've paid attention to the last two lessons, that though they gathered originally at the boathouse, they had to go out into the storm. That was the first lesson. They had to realize, I just can't sit here at the boathouse going, someone needs to be rescued. Hallelujah! I'm the chief of the boathouse. Someone needs to go rescue. It's a sad day when you've got a title and no position. Where's your position in the boat, or are you stuck at the boathouse? The boathouse is built for the boats. I'm a little ship, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to stay on my notes tonight. So in this series, we're following that story of one of the greatest small boat rescues ever in the United States Coast Guard history. And I'm putting together some practical connections for us to use in our daily life. So... It was the night of February 18, 1952, when a ferocious nor northeastern snowstorm came roaring into Cape Cod. It was a much fiercer storm than they actually believed was going to be happening, and the storms were violent. It was so violent that two tankers, the SS Pendleton and the SS Fort Mercer, literally broke in the seats. There were people on those tankers. So the first ship to break up was able to get out a mayday or a rescue uh, signal that got the Coast Guard mounted up to do a rescue attempt. And they threw everything they had at the Mercer. When the news later came, there's a second ship out there. There was no experienced people left to send. 
Can anybody been in church less than five years? Say amen. <laughs> so, an inexperienced crew was thrown together and sent out into the teeth of that storm in a 36-foot wooden rescue boat. Think about the conditions for a moment. Think about the situation for a moment. Think about the parallel for a moment. The waves of that storm were twice as high as their boat was long. <laughs> a young man by the name of Bernie Weber was put in charge of that vessel and in the blinding wet snow, freezing winter's night against all odds, he, odds, he and his crew answered the call. Let me interject, because a lot of people talk about their call of God. Here you got the phone call from that one. As I stated last time, simple, reasonable, sensible seamanship would have determined, you know, it might be pointless to throw four more lives away in what looked like a futile rescue effort. There's something in our nature, there's something in our DNA that we start to look at things and we weigh them out. I have a saying, heard it 100 years ago, price is out, value is just cost. And some of us have just settled in the comfort zone of cost and have missed the very understanding of what price represents to the lost. So we learned the last time I used the story that they were boarding this boat. And as they did, this experienced seaman advised them, act like you're going out there. Get lost. And just kind of make your way back. Come out of that storm. It's too, too risky to knock that door, to extend a hand, to Allow someone to be more than a stranger to you. And it is sad that many experienced saints have settled for the safety of the boathouse over the burden of saving and reaching the lost, merely because it's safe. People with past experience aren't necessarily helpful for present problems. Even Saul became a problem to David and Goliath, needed defeating. But this is a rescue mission. This was a rescue moment. We have to understand when we use the word rescue, it changes the dynamics. How many believe we're heading into the last days? How many, how many can sit? We could sit and converse about how bad things have gotten. I told my wife prior to church, there was a man jailed for calling his daughter, daughter in Canada. It's, it's, it's happening. And some of us are hanging out in the boathouse. And we're forgetting that we're on a rescue mission. We, 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 there's people that are going to be floundering. People are going to be debating. There's going to be people arguing about what needs to be done. But I'll tell you something. Rescue needs to happen. The church needs to spend its time outwardly looking to reach, seeking to save that which is lost. Are you hearing what I'm saying? A rescue, the word rescue abolishes reason. It wipes out calculation. I've heard some of us, and we won't stand before God and get out of this one, because we've made statements about if someone was to hurt someone in my family, bless God, I would. So God knows that each and every one of us has it in us for the right cause, we would. But not the cause of Christ. The greatest cause on the planet. The word rescue means nothing but courage. And the refusal to quit. And it was that courage that drove these inexperienced sailors out into the storm. Like Moses stepping into Pharaoh's court, three Hebrews 
going into a fiery furnace, Daniel into a lion's den, and Paul or his accusers. Because like that small boat, we too have been called the boathouse or the rescue. There's something about a Christian, there's something about a saint, I got a real one, that each week we come and gather here, congregate, initiate, and inspire to leave the boathouse, the church, to seek the lost. Mm -hmm. To go out into the stormy seas of a world in this life and rescue souls before it's too late. Some of us talk about it being too late. Some of us talk about understanding the signs of time. Some of us are able to quote scripture. Some of us are able to preach and teach. But the problem is, can you leave the boat house to make a difference? Jesus warned and he told, speaking to the last day rescuers, the last day warriors, not the warriors, those not looking for a safe place to dictate, but a front seat to row. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents, harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils and will scourge you in their synagogues. In other words, there's going to be an all-out war about the church. There are going to be those fighting for their position, fighting for their role, fighting because they want it this way, fighting because it's that way. And all that will stand in judgment when God says, but how bad did you fight to reach the lost? Where, where did your opinion lie in my calling, in my word, and it being right there in red and white to rescue the lost and pulling them out? Oh, you could pull the church down. You could manipulate the church this way. You wanted that. You wanted this or whatever. Your home's got to be this way. You got to be that way. Did this rescue attempt was it last year or the year before that a mine to kick a bunch of soccer kids back in, in, in one of the Asian uh, countries? They went to a cave and they all got lost in there and it flooded and they were sending divers. The whole world was gripped on a rescue mission. Can I tell you right now, that great a cloud, that great cloud of witnesses right now is watching what we're doing while the greatest rescue mission in the history of all men is going on. Are you in a lifeboat reaching? Are you hanging out at the boathouse making sure you got your seat? Last time I covered how they had passed the Chatham Bar, it was Basically, that moment they stepped into the roughest part of the seas, the, basically the point of no return. It was in that treacherous stretch of water where their tiny little boat was assaulted by waves twice as high as it was long. It was one of those waves that, that broke the windscreen out, knocked the compass loose, and they were, they were trying to navigate the waters by instinct and the sometimes seen light house that was in the distance so now basically they were truly out in the storm with no means to navigate they could have turned back all reason would have said well this is a little difficult we did what we could let's go back to the boat let's talk about I left the boat house well, let's go back before it gets too risky. But they didn't. Instead, a small boat, those few men, kept going. Bernie Weber said that when they were caught in the grip of the storm and it seemed like as if all was lost, there was in that time moments when he contemplated turning back that he would focus his thoughts on the men he was attempting to save. In his mind's eye burn, he would picture those desperate men trapped with that steel tomb. And he realized that he and his crew was their only hope. And that compelled him to press on in the rescue. Mm -hmm. It's kind of where we left him with the last time I spoke on this. 
pressing on in the midst of the storm. Pressing on when everything says why. It'd be easier to quit, go find a safe place to stay. Well, I did my time. How could they locate the Pendleton in the darkness, navigating by sheer instinct alone? The further they went, the fiercer the storm seemed to become. The wind, the snow, the sleet, the rain, along with the waves intensified, which was disorienting to the men, concealing any way to navigate. To make matters worse, if you can actually say that, their boat had a design flaw. I mean, this is this is a long time ago. We didn't have all these jet boats and speed boats and submergible boats. We didn't have them. The engine was prone to stall. Now, that boat would have been, been in trouble with me because if something stalls on me, I have this remedy. <laughs> Years ago, in my, my, in my high-tempered youth as a teenager, I got mad at an engine one time and took a hammer to it. Can I get a witness? Sometimes you just punch stuff and you get mad. Maybe it's a windshield. Maybe it's a wall. Maybe it's a, hopefully you grow out of it. Are you hearing me? So the engine was prone to stall if it rolled too much, which probably now lets us know was probably a fuel problem, getting the fuel to the motor problem. And so here they were trying to push through 60 to 70 foot waves in a boat that stalled. It was like maneuvering a boat through a bunch of dancing giants. Just a small speck out on a vast stormy ocean and tossed around by the waves. The engine would spit and splutter and stop, threatening each time to quit and never run again. The lifeboat's hull was durable. It was a tank, but because it was built so durable, it handled like one. It was difficult to steer, never mind the engine trouble. So when the engine actually did fail, they were at the mercy of those 60 and 70 foot waves until they can get it running again. This happened several times. This isn't just a make believe story. This happened. This isn't Captain Marvel or the Incredible Hulk, but none of that. This is a real life story recorded and, and written down. But through, the, through it all, through this storm, through these troubles, they pressed on because that's what real rescuers do. They risked. Despite the imperfect situation, which could have gotten all their attention, they pressed on. On. The focus was still the same. We're going to keep trying. We're going to keep pressing. We're going to head out there. I've got to pull somebody out. That little boat and those rescuers would be assaulted constantly by hurricane strength winds. And that boat would ride to the top and come crashing down on the other side. And finally, Bernie figured out how to maneuver the engine and the boat up and down the mountains of waves. Frantically, he would slam the engine into reverse and slow the boat just as the next wave would begin to lift them. Putting the engine back into gear, he would idle the engine until they neared the crest before gunning it to press through the wave to make it to the next trough. They were soaked to the bone, icy water. In fact, they stayed in it after a while of doing this wave after wave. He began to wonder that if perhaps they had already missed or gone too far to help the Pendleton. Maybe they lost it in the darkness. Just then, he saw what looked like a mysterious dark shape 
riding the waves just ahead of them. He slowed down the lifeboat and almost to a stop, began peering into the darkness and the torrential rain. He thought to himself, there's something there. He gave a quick order. He yelled out, Andy, go to the bow. Turn on the searchlight. In a few moments, the young seaman followed the order, flicked on the searchlight and a small beam of light. Not like what we have today. Cast a little light out there, illuminating a huge object a mere 50 feet away. <laughs> Had he gone any further, he would have collided this very boat or ship from the sink to hell. Last time we spoke about this, I encourage you to start praying that the Lord would give you at least one opportunity to reach out to someone each day. How many remember that? How many has been trying to do that? Huh? How many since the last time, up to three weeks now, have actually spoken to someone? If you, I, I will. I, if you've spoken to someone on purpose since then, please stay. Sister Curry, you got to stay because I'm about to tell on you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you from the kingdom of God. You can be seated. Uh, yesterday, I had to navigate what I call a stormy sea in my life. I can handle doctors. I don't know why. I can handle all sorts of, but I don't like the dentist. I have uh, a problem. I, 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 it's an open conversation with my dentist, who I didn't realize, and you may think this is gross until I give you my dental report, that I didn't allow them to clean my teeth for five years. And so my what do you call that? The dental hygienist is cleaning my teeth. You know, Mr. Crump, you really shouldn't go five years between hip cleanings. But if anybody does, you can. See, they don't understand that my tenacity in not wanting to see a dentist fuels my fire to make sure I don't need a dentist. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I'm using toothpaste and floss and brushing my teeth three times a day. Yeah, I'd like to say I'm all that. No, I'm just afraid of dentists. <laughs> As I'm conversing with uh, the dentist and the dental hygienist, I start to go that direction. Oh, oh, I know you're a pastor. I know your turn. I'm like, okay. What's going on here? I said, well, how do you know all this? You're a pastor. Speaking to it. Thank God. What a wonderful conversation we had about the things of God, about church, about Easter, and all this wonderful thing. You know, even a dentist appointment is an opportunity to share the gospel, a doctor's appointment, buying grocery. But let me tell you something. It can easily be overlooked if the rescue and pulling them out of the fire doesn't mean something to you. If your relationship with Jesus isn't a loved one, it's easier to be so self-centered and concerned about your stuff and your things that you miss that the church is on a rescue mission. The church, I know there's a lot of people that come to church uh, that aren't the church. Uh, if you want to know if you are the church, you're not just hanging out at the boathouse. You're going out on rescue missions when you leave here. In fact, when we leave here tonight, until the next time, you're on a rescue mission if you're the church. Anyway, I want to encourage you again to remain watchful and prayerful, because if you're not careful in the busyness of your self-centeredness, you'll stop being the church, and you won't see that your mission is right in front of you, that who you're looking to rescue may be right in front of you, and instead of being there to rescue them, you'll become shipwrecked with them, whether it's a waitress, a lawyer, a co-worker, 
a buddy, a neighbor, a friend. Any of them can become a part of the dark landscape of life and blend into your surroundings if you're not paying attention, praying in the Holy Ghost, building up yourselves that you're on a mission of rescue. Are you hearing what I'm saying? As Bernie Weber's eyes adjusted, they could see the steel hulk of the ship looming dark and ominous with no apparent signs of life. Bernie thought to himself, am I too late? Are we too late? There's no one left alive. Meanwhile, on the Pendleton, the men trapped there had almost lost hope. Suddenly, one of the men noticed something bobbing up and down in the rolling seas. A small light had been heading their way. Frank Fateau was the one on board, and, and he said, it was the most glorious sight they'd ever seen. This single light bobbing up and down in a stormy rolling sea. They just worked spellbound at the sight. The light looked no bigger than a pinhole against the inky dark blackness. The whole crew watched, mesmerized, as it went up and down over the huge waves, slowly inching slowly closer. As Bernie approached, Pendleton, his thoughts were that it was empty. There were no lights on board from the side that they came in on. So he began to motor around to the other side, where there was a string of lights and men. A whole bunch of men clinging, standing at the ship's rail, cheering. <laughs> His second thought was, my Lord, how big the Pendleton, how massive the mission was compared to his small boat. How can my ship so small help one so big? Sometimes the mission can seem daunting. In fact, he said at one point he wondered if he and his crew might be better off getting on board to Pendleton rather than stay on their tiny boat. But a small boat with integrity is always better than a large boat that's comfortable. There was no time left to contemplate, to think, because the crew of the Pendleton, Pendleton had already tossed the rope ladder, and men were already beginning to descend down to where his boat was. What followed was in a very dangerous situation and dance as he, Bernie tried to drive the lifeboat in toward the hull, just as each man jumped into the lifeboat before the waves separated them again. With the rolling seas, this was almost an impossible, but somehow they managed. And a few men uh, uh, had missed the lifeboat, but were quickly grabbed and pulled aboard by the crew. One after another, after another, after another, they came the ladder and jumped. You know, in tonight's lesson, it centers around the rescue itself, the pulling them out itself. We've, we've talked about recognizing the need. We've talked about going to meet the need. And now we're talking about actually doing the pulling them out. Jude gives us this advice about our mission and some have compassion, making a difference. And others say with fear, pulling them, pulling them out. Each man tried to jump from the ladder into the lifeboat. Many missed. The lifeboat was, after all, kind of a moving target. Tossed by the stormy waters, and it was absolutely critical that as soon as they hit the water, that some hand, somebody there was reaching to help them out. The waters were so cold that they would only last moments immersed in that water before they would lose consciousness. Once they were Pulled aboard, they were safe, but they could not handle being in the water for very long. And that's the image we get from Jude as someone pulling someone out of the fire because they won't last much longer. In our story, the water replaces that fire. In other words, basically the water, 
They're not going to survive in that condition. They're not going to make it to heaven in that condition. They're not going to make it in that condition. If they're, an, if they're an addict, if they're lost, if they're backslid, if they're not in the church, if they're not, there's got to be something about it. Hey, listen, you can't make it outside the church. Jesus created the church. He made the church. He instituted the church, set it up. Why? Because people need to be rescued. It's the only entity to rescue people's souls. So the church, the people, ought to be about the business of pulling them out. Someone is desperately in need for you and I to reach out and get a hold of them and pulling them out before they're lost forever. That's how the rescue mission works. That's what the church is doing. That's what it's about. Sadly, we, 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 we've turned church, and I'm going to say it again, I'm going to keep saying it. We've made it comfortable for hypocrites and uncomfortable to sinners. We'll cause problems in the, in the order of the church and quickly hug someone that's been a part of those problems. Because we forgot the mission of the church is to the lost. But sadly, the Bible talks about babies, people tossed to and fro, people sowing discord, people sowing division. Let me tell you why that happens. When you're so inward focused, you lose your mission. It's not enough to recognize that there are lost folks all around you. It's not enough just to seek an opportunity Christianity is a hands-on task. You and I are going to have to get involved. You are either involved or a lost spectator. You are going to have to get our hands dirty. You can't pull someone from the flames unless you exert a little effort. You can't pull someone from the frigid waters unless you put out some effort. You can't pull someone out of the lost wor world unless you put out some effort and recognize you got to get out of there. You got to get out of that environment. You're going to drown there. You're going to burn to death there. You will be lost if you don't get in the boat. At the end of Luke chapter 10, Jesus asked, who is my neighbor? He was asked by a lawyer. And rather than just giving a simple answer, Jesus told a compelling story. And it was a story that applies to this rescue mission concept of ours. You may be familiar with the parable of the Good Samaritan but you also might be a little confused. The neighbor, it would appear, is the man who went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and who was robbed, beaten, and left for dead on the roadside. The neighbor is the object of the story, the one who the other three characters encounter. First, a religious Jew, a priest, sees the man beaten, bloodied, and he crosses over to the other side of the street in order to avoid him. I might get my hands there. Next, a Levite, another Jew, after the order of the priesthood, but obviously not a priest, comes along, and when he sees him, he too crosses over to the other side of the street. They're familiar with the boathouse, but not with rescue. Then comes along a Samaritan, and to understand the significance of this, we have to understand that the Jews view Gentiles as dogs. They view Samaritan as something even less than dogs. Samaritans were of mixed ethnicity, the result of a marriage between a Jew and a Gentile. But in our story, it was a lowly Samaritan who helped this man, who reached out to rescue, who proved to be his neighbor. Jesus is making a simple but powerful statement. The lawyer has asked the wrong question. The question is not, who is my neighbor? Or how am I supposed to show mercy and grace to? The real question is, who am I? See, we're good at pointing out on the outside. But that's not what Jesus is bringing out here. He's bringing out in this story. 
Who are we when rescue is needed? Who are we when risk is mandated? Who are we when there's trouble? Who are we? That's why Jesus said to this, to each of those proclaiming to be a believer, he said in Matthew 25, 44 and 45, then shall they also answer him saying, Lord, when saw we be a hunger or a thirst or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them saying, verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you did it not to one of these deeds, you did it not to me. You see, if I'm not willing to inconvenience myself to rescue someone, anyone, if, I, if I'm not willing to sacrifice of my finances, of my efforts, of my need to save somebody, if anyone was ever in need of a rescue, it was a man who was beaten, robbed, and left for dead. But the religious figures in the story ignored him. Are you so religious that you ignore the rescue? Because they did their best to pretend that they didn't notice it. Well, I, I come to church. Leave me out of that. I don't want to be a part of I don't want to get involved in that. That's. You see, the story isn't about who the neighbor is. The story points out who we are. One of our Pentecostal authors, you all know if I said his name, I'm handing his book out recently wrote, in my view, the church is lacking a compelling sense of responsibility to those around us. I learned quite it real quick about people and their, what they think is their responsibility being a pastor. He goes on to clarify, we cannot be responsible for others, but we must be responsible to others. That's how Jesus looks at us. True Christians, real apostolic Pentecostal believers hold a responsible, a responsibility to those around them in need. There's no way we're going to let an altar call, call go without praying for someone. There's no way we're just going to walk down to the street and go about our business without being concerned about the rescue mission around us. No, I may have things to do, but I'll immediately, like that good Samaritan, walk away from whatever it is I got going on to reach out and rescue someone at my time, at my expense, because I'm a part of the kingdom of God. I'm a part of the body of Christ, and I'm going to, my life isn't to do my will. My life is to do his will. The reason you may not be hearing from God it's because you don't want to hear what he's saying. We have a responsibility, if we're the church, to a lost world, to be engaged in the continued act of pulling folks out of the fire. That's why Jesus started the church, not for us to find a com comfy place to sit, to preach a, 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 a ear-tickling little sermon every six months or to sing a song on the weekends or to prove my Christianity because I'm here every Sunday. This is based on what we do out there on whether we pass by on the other side or we get involved. The church is not for us to huddle in the boathouse. Safety. I'm saved, I'm at the boathouse. But it's for us to launch, for each of us to launch out into a storm, to start pulling them out. The church is not here for any other reason. Sadly, we got people coming and going and leaving and get upset. Oh, there's what they call the whole wandering church throughout every city and every state of people because they've lost, they think the church is about them. They think the church, no, you have to understand, once you get in the boat, you need to start reaching to pull somebody else out of there. Once you get, well, once you become a part of the boathouse, it's time to find your place in a boat and get out there. Who are you going to pull out of the fire? Who are you going to pull out of the darkness? Who are you pulling out? Who are you?
If we're his hands and we're his feet, why are we sitting in comfort? Who are we if we're not disciple makers? What have we accomplished if we don't reach our world with the gospel? Well, the problem is that for too many of us, hell and being lost for all eternity is no longer real to us. Because if we ever would catch a glimpse or get a real understanding of the terror of the hell, we would realize the tremendous responsibility that Jesus handed to his believers, his disciples, his saints. We've been handed something. The understanding that we each have a responsibility to a lost world is an understanding that I must know and find out what kind of person, what kind of Christian, what kind of saint, pastor, son is, what kind of Christian am I? Am I the one that he says, well done, done? Thou good and faithful servant, or I never knew you. It's based on what's important. It's based on the rescue mission. It's based on the story of the good Samaritan. It's based on... Bernie Weber had no idea how many men were on the Pendleton needing rescue. As they came the ladder, he, down the ladder, he began to realize there were many more of them that this small vessel was equipped to handle. There were indeed 33 men needing rescue on the Pendleton. But Bernie Weber's lifeboat was designed just to carry 12 men, including two or four. What am I saying? Can we say the word risk? Can we say the word risk? That's what a rescue is. As the men came down, one after another, Bernie began to recognize that there was a very real possibility that the boat would be overladen. It might not survive the trip. At one point, he even contemplated of pulling out and taking this load home, hoping someone else would come to rescue the rest. But he made up his mind, in his own words, that either they would all live together or they would all die together. What kind of man would I be if I didn't try to rescue? But that's the question, isn't it? That's the real question of Christianity. You, you know, Brother Bruce, keep running. By all means. It inspires and encourages all of us. Corey, keep being a worshiper no matter what's going on. Keep, yeah. But Lulu, don't you ever lose your enthusiasm. It is, but let me tell you something greater than all of that. Uh, what kind of men would we be if we didn't continue to reach out, lay aside all the sin and the weight that so easily besets the problem and start reaching the lost with all that we got, taking the risk and the rescue to get outside of position and prestige and opinion and roadblocks and saying we're all going to make it or none of us. In the story of the Good Samaritan, what kind of church would this be who failed to reach the lost? If we were more concerned about we got to keep brother, sister, so and so comfortable. We can't do this because of that, or we can. What kind of people are we if we're willing to cross over to the other side of the road so that we can know the hopeless condition of a lost world? Bernie was left with an impossible situation. What do you do? In Bernie's case, 
Spirit kept taking on man. One. Rescue. And they all began to fervently pray that the boat would be able to carry the burden. In 2015, Lee Stone King, an international evangelist, someone I've had the amazing privilege to be around, to hear him preach, who even got advice from, was invited to address the United Nations, along with 13 other speakers. Their given subject was to present solutions to end world violence. None of the other speakers had answers. But Brother Stone King shared his testimony, which I can't go into tonight. But basically of being miraculously raised from the dead, which is documented. Which he followed by a simple presentation of the gospel encapsulated in Acts 2.38. He concluded the testimony, the quick sermon, with a remark to the United Nations by simply saying, ladies and gentlemen, I do Jesus. What do you do when a lost world needs more than you have to give? You give them Jesus. You love them like Jesus loved you. You reach for them like Jesus reached for you. You risk for them like Jesus risked for you. You show them the kind of mercy Jesus showed you. That's what it's all about. Giving Jesus to somebody else. Like throwing a verbal life preserver, somebody drowning. It's like reaching into the flames to pull someone to safety. It's like the hands of the church reaching through the fiery gates of hell to save the lost. It's been said if you want to save the lost, you must first make a friend. Proverbs reiterates in 18 and 24, a man that hath friends must show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. It's easy to quickly read over that, but you have to understand making a friend is a little more costly. See, making a friend is more costly than just preaching or teaching a Bible study. In fact, it's so much easier to have the drive-by evangelism. Oh, here's the card. Here, let me. It's impersonal, sterile. But it helps us in our carnal mind feel that we fulfilled a duty because we want to be able to share our faith in ways that don't cost us. Don't affect me personally. If I really get involved, I'm, I'm going to have to be a Christian about this. Because if I become friends, that means I'm going to buy dinner. Now. That means if they got a need, I'm going to give of what I have. Because friendship is costly. There's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother, and he's defined because friendship is costly. Anybody have a friend call you up and need some finances? Need some help? You don't call a stranger because you don't know their phone number. You call a friend. Anybody ever had a friend help you out? Uh huh. Anybody have a friend help you out? I don't know about you, a friend helped me get right with, get right with him. Gave a way of escape for me, a real good friend. In the ancient Near East, hospitality was extended to whoever needed it, strangers and acquaintances alike. In fact, in the original form, the word hospitality is derived from two separate words. One word meaning friend, the other meaning stranger. So from the beginning of its usage, 
Hospitality included the idea of making friends out of strangers. Don't believe me? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, your family. There ought to be something about us preaching out to the lost and making them family. If we're going to be like Jesus, we ought to be standing up, finding someone I can buy supper for. I can help out. It's going to cost me to be their friend because I want to be like Jesus and pay the price because it's what was done for me. A significant message from the parable of the Good Samaritan is that our neighbor may well be a complete stranger in every sense of the word, but only until we make them. If you want to reach them, then you have to be willing to make them your friend, just like Christ did for us. A few years ago, there was a man, and I know I'm going long, but you know what? I think I got something important to say that I hope you stay in line and listen to. We know the story of Marcus Trell. It's quite famous, movies and books. The story about the tribe that saved him says that they used an old custom to keep him safe. A man by the name of Muhammad Gulam and his fellow villagers harbored and saved the life of Marcus Luttrell, who was gravely wounded. They saved a Navy SEAL. They saved someone that was considered an infidel. And even today, they say they are still proud of the courageous risk for rescue, and would do it again in spite of the disappointments and trouble that have followed. Taliban threatened, threatened so much, and in fact, they even took Muhammad Gulab's business from him. They completely went after him and destroyed his life. But he says, I'd do it again. We got to allow people to wound us and hurt us, because it's about the rescue. So in the face of point-blank Taliban threats to overrun the small village in Sabre in remote Kunar province, along with the poorest mountainous frontier with Pakistan, the villagers bravely protected, gave first aid, fed, clothed Marcus Sattrell, the wounded Navy SEAL, the only survivor. They insisted that they save Luttrell out of obedience to an age-old ethnic Pashtun tradition known as Pashtunwali. Their religion. Their beliefs. They acted on their belief system. They acted on the old standard. Mm. They were living up to their religion. Anyone here still believe in Christians? Anyone here still believe as Christians? Anyone here believe that we have as Christians an obligation to the mandate that Jesus gave us to reach the lost? In closing, as we all stand, Bernie and his team managed to save all but one man from the Pendleton, Brother Bruce. That one man fell from the ladder and as Bernie maneuvered to try to be able to pluck him out of the icy water, an unexpected giant wave tossed him into the man, driving his body against the ship, killing him instantly. Too often we let our failure stop us depress us. We question our faith. We question all that we're doing. And many times, many really good rescuers have allowed that to stop them from continuing the fight to rescue. But we too, like Bernie, 
can't give up and press on because like Bernie said, I owe it to the next man coming down the ladder to be here to rescue. I owe it to the next man. I, I, you can't win them all, but I owe it to the next one coming to continue to give the very best that I got. I owe it to my, my, my future efforts and evangelism cannot be stopped by past failures or defeats. We may not reach them all, but we have to reach as many before it's too late. With every head bowed for a moment, I wonder right now, if you would hear that still small voice, that call, of Jesus compelling his disciples to go to reach to love to continue will you today accept the responsibility that we the church have to a world of lost people Will you hold to the ancient manuscript, the old Christian antiquity of, I've got to reach somebody. i got to pull someone out. I'm not here just to hang out at the boathouse. I'm not here just to find a comfy seat while people are drowning or going to a devil's hell. I